Hey, I'm Dr. Gordon Walker. Are you fascinated by fungi? I've had a lifetime fascination with fungus, and ever since then I've been kind of obsessed. And so I want to teach you guys all about the incredible variety of mushrooms and fungi and all the different ways they live their lives. So let's go check out the fascinating world of fungi. Hey fungi friends, we're out here in the foothills of California looking for burn morels. So we're surrounded by an area that fire ripped through about two years ago, but we've got vegetation coming back and we've been on this adult Easter egg hunt to find morel mushrooms. These are Marcella true morels, and they're Ascomycete fungi that live inside of the trees and when everything burns they come out and fruit en masse. So we pulled a bunch out of here last year and there's not quite as many this year. It's also the start of the season, but we're finding some. So I've been out here hunting with Hi, I'm Liz. Forager extraordinaire. And we're out here also with... I'm Chris, and I'm the local guide for the day. He loves morels, and we're out here hunting, and we found a good amount, but we can certainly find more, so let's get to it. So we're down here looking for morels, and we just finally found a pretty good patch. They've been all over the place, hiding in between the mountain misery, but they're still, you know, difficult to see. And they're down in the ground, they're really blending in. Oh, there's one. But some of them are straight up buried, so I have to kind of like get in here unbury them, keep finding them. And the best thing is when you get down on your hands and knees, you can see close to the ground and you can actually spot the profile of these morels separate from like a pine cone because these things don't look similar side by side, but from several feet away, it's very easy to confuse them. Look at that. So these true morcella have like deep pits in the cap and they're hollow inside. And the burn morels, the black morels are connected the bottom of the cap to the stipe. And so with all those features, you're sure that you've got a true morcella rather than a, a false morel or a verpa, helvella, gyrometra. Mm, beautiful aroma. And you'll see these are like other ascos, they're pressure sensitive. So sometimes if you blow on them, you'll see spores come out, sometimes not. But I've definitely been picking morels and noticed just like clouds of spores coming off them when you put a little air pressure change or wind on them. Post fire, you have a different set of fungi that show up. Because if you look out at the forest floor right now, it's grass, sticks, right? That's food for fungi. But what if all that stuff is charred and burnt? It's different kind of food. So there's different kinds of mushrooms that show up to eat that different kind of food. The charred, burnt wood, when you burn something, you create these things called heterocyclic amines. They're very cancerous. It's why eating barbecued food can lead to higher rates of colon cancer. So if you have this very different carbon substrate, your normal mushroom probably isn't gonna like that. And even maybe that normal mushroom got totally burned up by the fire. But there's a whole class of fire-specific fungi, morels included, that specialize in breaking down all that black stuff after a fire. So there's this succession of organisms that come after a fire where like the, the pyro specific fungi are there to eat the black stuff and then kind of make 
the carbon and the nitrogen and the nutrients bioavailable for everything else that's out there, the bacteria. And it's, it's not just fungi, it's the whole arc and community that is there. The fungi are sort of like that cornerstone of turning over and recycling and starting the process of biological secession so that the bacteria and the other fungi and the plants and the animals can all come back post-fire. Otherwise, it would just sit there black and barren where there's not enough moisture or it burns so hot it killed all the fungi. It just sits there black and barren for years without regenerating. But if you still have an ecosystem intact, if it didn't burn too hot, if there's still moisture, if there's still the ability for fungi to kind of get a foothold and do their thing, boom, life comes right back. So this is a fern from the top. If we flip it over, see all these little brown fuzzy things? These are actually the spore-bearing fruiting bodies of a fern. So ferns are not flowering plants. They instead reproduce by spore, and these little brown structures are called sporangia, similar to what slime molds produce to disperse their spores. It's just a sporangia is a term for any spore dispersal structure. And I just think it's so cool because ferns are kind of like living fossils and these are ancient plants that are still here doing their thing doing their ecological niche and right now they're just dropping spores all over the place to uh, help themselves reproduce but it's pretty cool on the bottom of a fern to find stuff like this there's a whole set of fungi that are called endophytes and there's bacteria that are endophytes too but they are things that actually live literally inside plant tissue so like we have our human microbiome, you know, we have bacteria in our guts. Plants have a microbiome, not just on their surface, not just on their roots, but literally inside because plant cells are like big squares. And in between those squares, there's room. That room is taken up by tenants, bacteria and fungi, yeah. endophytes. So if we think of a forest kind of like a city, like each tree is like a building and all of those fungi and bacteria inside the trees are kind of like the tenants living in those buildings. And it's not always a good relationship. Like, much of the time they're aligned, just like tenants in a building might be happy living there. But if the landlord jacks up the rent, they're like, you, dude, like, we're leaving. Yeah. Or maybe you have a tenant who won't stop playing drums at midnight. You gotta kick them out, drop some leaves, get rid of that endophyte. So those, a lot of those endophytes end up being things that when the tree dies, they come out and then eat the tree. Because it's like there was a zombie apocalypse and they're suddenly like, well, let's cannibalize the building because there's, you know, there's nothing left. So a lot of those fire fungi specifically are endophytes that when fire rips through, those are the first things to come back and start breaking down all that burnt plant matter and cycle things over. So these little mochi of the wood looking things are cryptoporous. This is a parasitic polypore that infects a tree and ends up killing it. 
What's really interesting is these are moved around by an insect vector, a bark beetle, that burrows into the tree and is carrying those spores on it, infects the tree, and then as these things mature, the bark beetle lays its eggs inside of them, so the larvae grow up inside of the mushroom, eating it, living inside of it. And this is a polypore, but you can't see the surface because it's covered, thus cryptoporous, and the larvae are inside of here, and then when it matures, they bust out, covered in those spores, and go on to infect more trees. And this is a, a cycle that is just affecting pine trees and conifer trees all over California because there's been some invasive bark beetles that are exacerbating this problem. And usually this can be solved by fire, but even here we see a tree that is burned is covered in these cryptoporous, which means that the trees around here are getting infected and the disease is spreading. But I'll show you what this looks like inside. There is kind of a hollow inside. So the pore layer is up here and it drops spores down on the bottom part and the larvae inside of this and then pop out when it's mature. Sorry, it's getting all brown, but these are really like interesting textured mushrooms. Per usual, the lesson with morels is that if you see one, put your stuff down and look around because there's going to be more hidden around in the duff and kind of like just completely cryptically existing <laughs> down here in the in the dirt. But they're out here, even if they're hard to find. Ooh, cooking morels. I mean, a classic is to just do like a dredge in egg and flour and breadcrumbs and fry it. And that's, that is excellent. Classically though, they're done in like a cream sauce and often that's done with dried morels, which have a lot more of that umami depth of flavor. Personally, when I cook morels, I usually like to kind of mix the fresh and the dried so you get the best of the texture and the best of the umami flavor. Honestly, they're super versatile. They'll go in just about anything. Put them on pizza, put them in pastas, eggs. All the classics are great. They go really well in world cuisines too, though, because they cook them in Chinese food. They cook them in Indian food, African stews. Morels grow all over the world, and so they've been adapted into every single different culinary tradition. And they're delicious everywhere. So there's no wrong way to cook it. The only thing you can do is not clean it well, and then it's kind of gritty and gross. So I like to soak them a couple times until you really get the water to run clear. And then you're going to have a much better morel eating experience if they're clean. So as we're looking around, we're paying attention not just to the ground, but also the trees. Because we're thinking about the intensity of the burn. And areas that have the best morels are generally somewhat shaded. So we have lost a lot of the green on the top of these trees, but there's still some needles. And that means there's a pretty thick, good duff layer. So even from far away, you can look to see, is it burned and totally stark? Or is there still some you know, needles up there and are the trees still alive. Within that, you want to be in a zone that hasn't burned too hard, but it's very helpful to find big stumps that have been burnt out. So going to, uh, rather than a tree that's still alive, a, a stump that burned all the way down, there's a high likelihood of finding a good big flush around the base of that. Sometimes you'll find, especially as the season goes on, you'll find morels deep down in the ground where it's a little bit cooler and more moist. Sometimes you find a whole bunch of them in a hole, and that's called a honey hole, full of morels, big ones, be just morels all the way around on the inside. Right now, we're just kind of roaming around, catching the stuff on the very surface that has had the right amount of moisture and temperature to pop up a mushroom, but it's not all over the place. It's sort of here and there, it's a little patchy. And as we walk around, we're trying to establish, you know, what are the trees, what are the mosses, what are the other plants we're gonna see that tell us where the morels are. And we certainly don't have it, you know, fully dialed in, but we're doing pretty good. And we're kind of just exploring and, and seeing what's out here. So, you know, it's, it's all about taking in the habitat, taking in all those contextual clues as you walk through the forest and try to just kind of gain this holistic understanding of what's around you and what kind of habitats the mushrooms are gonna like the best. Because we can guess, we can project, we can try to understand what they're going through, but ultimately, Mushrooms do what they want to do. Morels, especially, are a little temperamental, and they, they are especially prone to just popping up in weird places and not following our expectations for what a mushroom should do or where it should be, or even what it associates with. It's cool to kind of have this chance to explore early in the season and wonder how it will progress and maybe even how different species of morels will come up as a result 
of hunting at different times of the year. So right now it's early, it's probably the burn stuff, it's right here on the surface as the season goes on. The snow will melt and they'll move up in elevation, but we may still see mushrooms down here in holes like I was talking about. And even right in front of us is a beautiful example of a tree. We're surrounded by live trees, but here we have this tree that burnt all the way down and there's all this stuff around it. So not right now, but I wouldn't be surprised if at some point this season, a whole bunch of morels pop up right around the base of this thing. So as you walk through the woods, you can look for trees like this that have burned really hard and know that around the base, there's gonna be a higher likelihood of finding morels. Not every time, but again, you do that habitat guessing game again and again, and sometimes you get lucky and find a whole bunch of morels, and that's very satisfying. Skin's red.